and welcome to all of you. This is going to be a very special luncheon um, featuring the co-founders of an initiative called Breaking the Impasse, in which a Palestinian and Israeli business and civil society come together to work towards a resolution of conflict and peace. We're honored to welcome Munib Mashri, chairman of the Palestinian Development and Investment Company, and Yossi, Yossi Vardi, one of Israel's leading high-tech entrepreneurs, to discuss the importance of breaking the impasse. They'll be joined on the panel by Miroslav Dusek, who is senior director of the Middle East and North Africa um, team of the World Economic Forum uh, in Switzerland. And they, the uh, World Economic Forum has helped sponsor breaking the impasse. And the Middle East Institute is very happy to play its role here, too. We're at a tight schedule. Uh, we need to finish the panel by 2 o'clock so that we can uh, join the third panel of the conference today. But before I say another word, I want to say again how much I appreciate the support of the uh, lovely Sahuri family uh, who uh, consistently supports uh, this luncheon event at the Middle East Institute uh, annual conference. Um, the panel today will be moderated by a member of the Middle East Institute's Board of Governors, Ambassador Daniel Kurtzer. Dan has the uh, distinction of serving as U.S. Ambassador to both Israel and Egypt. I first met Dan in 1988 uh, when he was one of the key drafters of Secretary Schultz's peace initiative. He's played an instrumental role in bringing about the Madrid Peace Conference in 1991. Uh, in fact, he's worked most of his 29-year career on the Palestinian-Israeli peace process and is regarded in the United States and elsewhere throughout the world as one of the most thoughtful and creative diplomats and experts uh, on the process. Ambassador Kurtzer is currently professor at Princeton University where he has written and edited several books and now I think we're ready to begin. Dan? Okay. All right, thank you, uh, Wendy, and thank you all for, for coming today. Uh, in the immortal words of Monty Python, now for something totally different. Uh, normally in Washington, when you convene a panel with an Israeli and a Palestinian, you're going to face one of two possibilities. Either they're going to fight with each other and rehash the entire history of the conflict, or they will paint such a depressing picture of the conflict that everybody goes home and says it can't be fixed. What we have today are two extraordinary individuals who have come together in support of the idea that peace is not only doable, but it's imperative. And they have devoted considerable attention within their own societies, as well as in their interaction with each other, to try to make the argument that the current peace process needs to be supported, and particularly that the efforts of the United States and Secretary of State John Kerry and President Obama need to be supported. The initiative, Breaking the Impasse, was the idea of the World Economic Forum. Mirik is with us today to talk about that. And it's one of the most creative initiatives that we have seen in the context of so many years of uh, peace efforts. So what we're going to do today, we're going to have a very brief set of introductory comments. I'm going to then moderate a discussion for a few minutes and then open the floor to you and I think you'll find that this discussion will leave you actually optimistic. At least I hope you do. So why don't we start, Mirik, if you could uh, launch us with a little bit of a description of uh, breaking the impasse. Ambassador Kurtzer, uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Thank you very much to the Middle East Institute for uh, having us and for this uh, fantastic lunch here. And also thank you, uh, Munip and, and Yossi, for uh, making the long journey and for your uh, continuous commitment. It's, it's really been a privilege and pleasure working with you. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the World Economic Forum, uh, on behalf of Professor Schwab, the executive chairman and, uh, and founder of the World Economic Forum. And we've been really lucky because we've, been, uh, we've seen this uh, community evolve. We've been the chaperones of this community. Uh, since it was launched in 2012. And so, of course, Munip and Yossi will be the, the, the centerpieces of this discussion today. But I thought I would share with you a few insights on the evolution of this community, which could help the discussion uh, afterwards. A few basic facts about the BTI, the Breaking the Impasse Initiative. 
It was established in 2012 at the World Economic Forum that we held in Istanbul. It has over 300 uh, uh, members. There are leaders, Palestinians, Israelis, international leaders from the Arab world, from, from the international jury, mainly coming from the private sector, but not, uh, not entirely. They represent major employers in both economies, really uh, big, uh, big companies, big, big employers. Uh, they also represent a, a lot of the GDP of the Palestinian and the, and the Israeli economies. I think what should be underscored is that the, the, uh, the goal of this community was never to replace governments or to negotiate on behalf of governments, but rather to support the official process, support uh, political leaders. We disagree on a lot of things. Uh, we would say we disagree on a lot of tactical things, but there is a clear strategic alignment around a few issues that I would like to mention here, that the status quo is, uh, is not only unsustainable on, over the long term, but it's, it's urgent uh, that that, uh, that status quo is not there anymore, and that a negotiated agreement be on, based on a two-state solution offers the best way to end the conflict, to provide security for both Israelis and Palestinians, and of course bring enormous socioeconomic dividends for all, uh, all involved. Now, the origins of this, very briefly, before we go into the main discussion. Why I'm mentioning the origins is because it's very emblematic of, of what this community is about. Uh, what happened in 2012 at the Istanbul summit is that uh, Munib and Yossi jointly, I would say almost intuitively, approached Professor Schwab on the margins of this and said, uh, we are at a moment where there are no talks, nothing is happening, there is a lot of unilateral movement, unilateral moves by both sides. Uh, and also, there is the Arab Spring, so everything is focusing on the aftermath of the Arab Spring, and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is really had already fallen to the back burner uh, of the international agenda, and we must do something. And so it was a very intuitive uh, thing, and it was going against the conventional thinking of that time, so it was, in a way, very avant-garde. There was one thing. The other thing which was very interesting about the evolution is it was very bottom-up, so there was no prior coordination with any of the governments involved. This was a spontaneous approach, uh, and only after, of course, there is, there, is, there is a connection with the official process. But this is a very bottom-up process. What we did, in a nutshell, we responded to the, to, the, to the appeal, and we held first private meetings in Geneva, then in Davos, and we built up the community. So from an initial group of uh, 10, 12 people in Istanbul, we grew to 30 people. We tested the waters whether this is only a naive group of people that, are, that think uh, things can be done. And we clearly realized that there is a substantial mainstream constituency for peace within Palestine and Israel that wants to work together. Uh, so a, a critical moment came uh, this past spring at the World Economic Forum at the Dead Sea in Jordan were for the first time this community, at that time already having over 300 members, uh, publicly came out uh, together with Secretary Kerry, President Perez, and President Abbas, and made an appeal uh, to the international community to go back to negotiations. So you may argue what role this community actually played in, in, in defreezing and relaunching the talks that w which happened uh, this past summer, but we definitely played a role. And there was one moment, of course, you could say, okay, this is all about breaking the impasse in, in going back to the negotiating table, so now everything is done and, and we, can, we can go home. But I think we realized very soon after the, the, the relaunch of negotiations that the critical part is still facing us, the, that we need to support the political leaders for the arguably what will be the toughest job uh, to arrive at arriving at a, at a, at a solution. So, this is what's guiding us right now. I think it will be uh, part of our discussion today, but I just felt I should share with you uh, the evolution of this community uh, as it developed so far. Thank you very much. I, I suggest all of you take a look at the uh, bios of these three extraordinary people. I'm not gonna repeat them, but uh, you'll now have a chance to hear from Munib for some introductory remarks. I want to stand up <coughs> because I have a a little bit ache in the back coming across the Atlantic. Uh, good afternoon for everybody. I'm really honored 
untouched by such a group. I want to thank uh, Wendy and Kat, Kate for, and of course Daniel for this place and for their institute who is catering for us to meet today. Um, Washington, to us, to you, C and I, a very important place because still America is the leader of the world um, and we hope that the leader of the world will participate with UC and, uh, of course, the WEF and myself to bring about a peaceful, a peaceful settlement for this conflict that has been bothering us for the last 60 or 70 years, 65 years. Over the last 40 years, I've been working for this moment, and the moment is coming. I think we have a crucial six months. Three months has gone. We have still six months. I think the difference in this time of solving the problem is, I think, uh, the administration and uh, John Kerry, Mr. Kerry, the Secretary Kerry, had put nine months to say for the parties that we need to come to an agreement. Over the many months we had worked together over the years that I known Yusuf Vardi, he's a man of honor, he is close to my heart. Uh, he has done a lot to his community, and I think he and I want, before we die, we want to see this subject settled. We wanted to see a better future for our grandchildren and for the world. I think this, and we, we're saying this uh, from the deep commitment that we have to the cause, and we look at you as people who can support us. I'm going to give you a chance to, 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 of course, ask the questions. But we are in a very unique time. The time is of, of a very opportune time. The players are excellent. And I think the uh, uh, people in the administration and the foreign ministry are really great. I mean, the, and then we have the WEF, of course, who has all the credibility in the world that we could do something. I think, I hope, <clears throat> this will be a jump, uh, it's a jumping step toward uh, going to Davos. Um, the, I feel there is something in the air, and I think if all our efforts are put to tell Mr. Kerry and M Mr. President, we are behind you, go ahead and do the deal, do the deal of the whole world will be satisfied with it. I think the region is standing on top of a volcano. The volcano is simmering, and we need a lot of wisdom to stop this volcano, to stop this catastrophe which is coming if we stayed away, if we stayed stringent with, um, with what's going on. I hope today we'll answer all your questions. I'm optimist, I'm optimistic to find a solution, a solution that it will be a win-win, a win for the world, win for everybody who cares about the region, and a win-win for Israel. We are committed to the state-state solution, uh, two-state solution, viable solution, viable states um, that we are comfortable with, that it will fulfill our aspiration, the aspiration of the Israelis, because you see and I, we feel that we are committed, we feel that we are destined to live together, and we want our grandchildren to live together. We want to have a viable Palestinian state living side by side in harmony and peace with Israel. I would like to see Israel to be the first state to support the creation of a Palestinian state, a viable Palestinian state. Because when you are a neighbor, you always desire to be this neighbor 
is as happy as you are. We want to be as happy as the Israelis. We want to be as prosperous as the Israelis because we share a lot of values with them. Uh, I will stop here and we hope that we, we, we could answer all your questions. But again, I'm honored to be here. I'm honored to see Akhi Abdul Latif Al Hamad is here. I'm, my family is here. I brought my grandchildren to be witness to this and to be part and to be part of the legacy. I have Munib uh, Jr. with me here. So um, he, he will say that he want to turn the page and he want to have a good relation with his new neighbors, the good neighbors that we can contribute to the world a lot. We want to go together to the whole Arab and Islamic world to say we can help and we can do something. We want Israel to be loved and not to be boycotted. It's up to Israel. I hope they will do it. I hope they will become part of the region. This is a huge ocean, Islamic ocean, Arab ocean. They have to be, we are part of it and we want to work for the welfare, for the goodness of this thing with their technology and know-how. I think we can do a lot together. I think the bonus is great for the Israelis to have peace in the region. Thank you very much. I've had the uh, privilege of knowing both Munib and Yossi for probably 30 years, and Munib just ruined my next line because I was going to say we were teenagers at the time we met, but <laughs> since he brought his grandchildren here, I can't really say that. Yossi. Okay, uh, I prepared some, some lines, but I must start with some personal reflections, which kind of flooded me when the cab approached this. Hotel not far from here, there is the Madison Hotel, I think, a few blocks, five blocks, or 15th 15, 15th Street. Uh, in October 78, I spent six weeks at the, at the Madison Hotel. We were a group of Israelis in the middle where the Americans probably eavesdropping to both us and the Egyptians. And under us, there were the, the Egyptians in what was uh, called the Blair House uh, negotiations, which were the, the, nego the specific negotiation following the Camp David Accord. At that time, I was a young executive in the government. And my role was to Munib hate when I say that to give back the, the, the oil field, he told that the, the, the oil field in the Gulf of Suez, Suez he tell me you cannot give back something which is not yours. <laughs> so, so we argue about the terms. It was not an easy, an easy. This is a true story, by the way. It was not, it was not an easy decision at that time was the height of the second oil crisis, in the ground there were one billion bells of oil, and at that time, that, this, that month, the Shah of Iran left to Contadora, and, uh, and uh, we were negotiating with the Egyptians. Our chief of staff, when Sadat came to the Israeli parliament on the 2nd of November, 77, said this is a trap. Be careful, this is a trap. And in spite of the doubts, and we had to give back the Sinai, again, excuse me for the give back, but uh, <laughs> we had to give back the Sinai. Tough decisions, tough decision. Nevertheless, under the leadership of Begin, Begin, not somebody from the left, Menachem Begin, from the right, an agreement was executed. And since then, at the border of Egypt and Israel, not a single boy was killed. Not Egyptian and not Israeli. This was 35 years ago, not a single boy. Not a single mother had to shed tears for a son who was killed. And as many Israelis and many Palestinians know, I think there is not a single family in this region which was saved from this 
horrifying experience of losing somebody for what? Then in October, in November 95 to February 96, I spent four months in this very hotel. At that time, I was already a businessman, but I uh, was asked to join the negotiations with the Syrians, what was known as the White Plantation, but the back office was... In, uh, in this hotel, we spent four months trying to negotiate a peace agreement with the Syrians. Unfortunately, this didn't happen, and I really pray that the day will come not far from today that we will be able to complete, to complete the job. Now, many people ask me, are you really optimistic that there will be peace with the Palestinian, and I'm saying it's not a question if you are optimistic or not. This is, we are doomed. We have to work on it whether we are optimistic or not optimistic. I'm optimistic because I got to know the Egyptians and the Palestinians and the, and the Jordanians and the Syrians, and I know very well in my heart that 95% of all decent people in the region, never mind what is their ethnic background really want to get, to get an end. There are different versions what kind of end, but the parameters are known. Some solution which will provide justice and uh, respect and dignity and future and security and well-being and a good future to all the people of the region should be found, and I believe it can be found. Now, I want to tell you one word about the Israeli BTI. The Israeli BTI, strangely enough, is a non-sectarial group of 183 people right now, and it's keeping growing every day. People from the right and from the left, religious and non-religious. It's not a monolithic group of hallucinating people from the left. It's a wide, a wide, and it's important that you will note, a wide, and, and Munib will testify to it, a wide spectrum of decent people that believe that in spite of differences of opinion, we should get into an end of this conflict. We should create two states for the two, for the two people. And in, in their behalf, I'm coming here uh, today, that th this group of people is consists of the leading business people of the most influential uh, business organizations in Israel who decided that enough is enough and stood up in order to express their voice and their commitment to support the process, to advocate the process, and not to be anymore the silent majority. Both in the Palestinian community and the Israeli community, about 70 to 80 percent of the people would like to have a two a two-state solution. I admit that there are different versions of the, of the vision of what are the two states should be. Munib version is not probably my version. We didn't compare it. And I will tell you why we didn't compare it, because we came to the conclusion that it is the role of the leaders to forge the agreement. They will have to negotiate. They will have to do painful concession to each other. And in the last 10 years on the Israeli side, 17, 17 peace programs have been submitted and all of them went into, I don't know where. It's, we, we came to the conclusion that in order to be effective and productive, we should support the leaders in their efforts. And the last thing in the, in the component is the role of the United States. I traveled this morning from Tel Aviv to talk to you, and at 6 o'clock I traveled back to Tel Aviv. It's 19 hours each direction, and my main reason, other than that uh, uh, Dan Kertzer told me I should come, so I said, okay, I come. <laughs> and I knew there will be a chicken in uh, lunch because I had many, many lunches in the United States. <laughs> It was, not, it was not too bad, I must tell you. 
I came to tell you that the role of the Americans is critical. It was critical with the Egyptian negotiation. It was critical with the Jordanian negotiation. And there is no room to cynicism. It's perfectly all right to be doubtful. It's perfectly all right to put a lot of question marks. It's perfectly all right to say, we have to see what happened, but we have to work and you, nobody is allowed or has the right to be cynical because these things are very, very important. They are greater than all of us. This will determine the future of this region which is torn by blood and hatred and fights and conflicts all over the place for too many years, for too many generations. We need the, your active support to help in this process. I would like also to say one thing. In the beginning, when we compare the narratives, let me tell you, maybe you are not aware of it, but the Israeli narrative is not like the Palestinian narrative. It's two different ways to look on the situation. Each one can point fingers. Each one has, have a lot of grievance and a lot of hardship, etc., with the other side. And we can spend our time to decide what is the reason, what are the history, etc. What we decided that while not giving away the narrative and not giving away the grievance, we are trying to focus on the joint future of the region, which is, very, which is the most constructive and most important thing to be done. So we are a group of 300 people. We are not willing to take the current situation as a given. We think it can be changed. We think the interest to change it across any political or sectorial or ethnical or religious belief or persuasion. We think the leaders, the two leaders, are capable to do it, and we should give them uh, our, our unconditional support. Uh, there will be a lot of discussions when, if the agreement, the, the negotiation re reach an agreement, there will be a lot of debate, and we are committed to support the leaders until a two-state solution will be achieved, and I'm personally sure that we will achieve a two-state solution because the current situation is utterly not right, not accept acceptable, harmful, not humane, and cannot continue. Thank you, Yossi. I, I want to just uh, address you. Please, today, the Washington people, you're usually polite. You don't ask questions. Please ask as much questions as you want so that we can be all together in this. We're coming here to be part of solving this conflict. And we think, that we think Washington is a very important place. So please be with us so that we will know what's in your, your mind. Don't be too polite not to ask a question. Ask the hard questions, and you could hear what is the stand of the BTI, we tell you, and each one what we think that it should be done. But I hope that we come up completely satisfied to really to say we want to support the leaders, as Yossi said, but more so to have the constituency bigger to support John Kerry and the administration. Thank you. Hey, before, before we get to the, uh, the questions from the, uh, the audience, let me dig down a little bit in okay. what you both said. As I understand it, your role as you see it is to impress upon your respective leaderships the importance of making peace. Without revealing secrets, what is it that you tell President Abbas, Prime Minister Netanyahu, that may help move them when they're dealing with hard substantive issues, Jerusalem, settlements, refugees, you name it. What is it that you can say to them other than the fact that you support peace? Munid. Good question. I think when I see uh, Mr. Abbas, I think 
Uh, let, let, let me just say the background. In 1994, I was sitting with late President Arafat in Tunis. I didn't like Oslo. I, I, I was shouting, he was shouting, and then finally he said, sit down. So I sat down. He was older than me, so I have to obey him. And he said, Munib, we, we were in Jordan, we made Jordanian mad. We went to Lebanon, we made the Lebanese mad. I think we learned what we want to do. I want to take the hardest decision and to say I want to make peace. And this peace is by going home and by saying that from what I see is the, what the claims we say and we have 100%. No, we want to say what is the 1967 border looks like. Gaza and West Bank connected and Jerusalem and at that time we didn't have the Arab Peace Initiative but he was he convinced me that we have to take this hard decisions we have to take this tough thing because we want to go home and he said I don't want to have army I don't want to have anything I want to give all the feeling of security to the Israelis and he was telling this in 1988 when Danny Abraham, I was with Danny Abraham, and he told him, look, Danny, no army, nothing. We want to live, we, we want to enjoy life, finished. We have this, whether we are one nation or we are cousins. So the, the most important thing is that he had the will. It was, it was a good feeling that we bury the, we don't want, we bury the blames, we bury the, uh, uh, the, bad feelings, we want to start a new page. And I think this time, this time, Mr. Abbas is committed. The uh, Palestinian, uh, Palestinian leadership is committed. And we have the ambassador here, he could tell me I'm wrong. They are committed to a very strong peace to, uh, to have, to live, to live with the Israelis and to be part of the region, Khalas finished. We want to contribute together. We want to live together. We want to do things together. And we want to love each other as much as we can to bring this thing. So from the Palestinian side, I assure you, they have all, all the willingness to continue to do this thing, to continue what Oslo stood for. Now, there's some things they need to do, and I agree with Yossi, is they have to negotiate, and I hope it's a win-win situation. America, we have to help America because also it's, we need a third partner who we could trust, and I think uh, America is very well trusted in Israel, much more trusted than in, in the Palestinian side because I hope, but this time, this time I think Mr. Kerry really means business and Mr. Obama needs business, Europe needs business, and we need you, we need you to help us to push, to encourage the American leadership to make this step. I always encourage our people to make it because it's a must, as Yossi was saying, it's a must, we need to live together, finished. I feel, I feel bad for the mothers. One of the mothers sitting here, my daughter-in-law, she has a son who's 22, he was shot, and he's in a wheelchair, but he's here to say, I want to live, I want to live with the Israelis, I want to have a better future, I want to have this, and maybe he will, he, but let's, let's do it. And I'm sure on the Israeli side, you have also casualties, bad things, and we want to finish this chapter. And I think Yossi and I, with the help of you and the help of the WEF, <coughs> we have a, a, an opportunity we should not miss. This is the opportunity, and please be vocal, and uh, let's do it together, let's tango together. It's very, very important this time. We have a, a crucial six months. This six months, we could do a lot. Let's do it. Jesse, what do you, uh, what do you say to the Prime Minister that you think can make an impression upon him uh, based on this First experience. of all, uh, Dan, I don't, uh, I, you, you shouldn't underestimate uh, Bibi Netanyahu. He's a very smart gentleman, graduate of one of your best uh, institutions, and I don't have to tell him what are the benefits of peace. What we, he knows it very well, and he, like 
every Israeli is torn between the yearn for peace. I don't think there is a single Israeli who don't want peace, or maybe very few, really. And the security considerations, you know, he has a big responsibility on his uh, shoulders. And as I, as I told you, and I'm not saying it as a spokesman of Netanyahu because I'm not, I have no doubt in my mind after, after I met him uh, in recent times that he really won't uh, want to repeat what Begin, Begin has done. And it was shown two days ago, but the freeze he put on the, on the settlement. What we tell him, we tell him that a group of 100 60, 80 of the business leaders of the country are willing to stand up, which is not very common within the Israeli business uh, community. It was even less common when Munib and I spoke where the whole peace issue was kind on the back burner. And we, we, we told him we are not going to be silent. We are, we are going to support the process we are going to take uh, as active role as, uh, as possible. And uh, the benefit, everybody knows the benefit. The benefits are the fact that we are business people doesn't mean that we see only the economic benefits. There are moral benefits, there are benefits to the young generation, there are benefits to the, to the whole uh, regional construction, the benefits to the standing of Israel in the world, all, all, all the things are, are really known. The only question is if Abu Mazen and Netanyahu will hit it right like Begin and Sadat or Rabin and, uh, Arafat. and Arafat or even uh, Rabin and, uh, and, uh, and King, King Hussein. You know, it was done in the, in the past. This one is more complicated because this time it's not two different territories, but it's... It's the same thing, but uh, many of us believe that uh, especially a leader that from the right will be able to, to, to do it. I, my, my feeling, again, I am not spokesman of Netanyahu and I don't know any information that, that you people don't know, but uh, my feeling is that if he's, if he's satisfied with the security Issues, and again, I don't want to go and repeat the whole thing that all of us know. He has some reasons to be, to be cautious, let's put it this way, but I, I hope he will be able to pull it together. And all of us, all the group, hope, uh, hope also. Let, let me just, if you allow me to, to add one thing, I want to add one thing to what uh, Mirak said about the role of the WEF, why I think the role of the WEF is so critical. Mirex started with 2012, but as we remember, actually the World Economic Forum started the MENA process, the Casablanca meeting, which was really the watershed in the whole, in the whole way how the region uh, perceived itself. They have that. To those who don't know, they created a four major meetings of uh, Israeli and regional business leaders and politicians in 94, 95, 96, 97. It started a lot of process. Some process continued. Many process were halted, but the whole thing was changed. And I know that this initiative that Munib and I are involved together with many of our friends is changing again the narrative. You know, strangely enough, when we meet, what you get is a feeling of joint sorrow, not a feeling of hatred or, or finger pointing, etc. As I said, Munib has a big book of all the, all the things which he can complain and be bitter about, and we have also a book, but we said we put the book on the side because it's not going to resolve anything right now. Let's see how we create more, a better future for our kids, for our grandson, for the region. Mirik, uh, what, what would you think the uh, next immediate steps are? Obviously, there's an idea of attracting as many business people from the two communities. And from abroad. 
and from abroad. What would you think the next steps are to advance this initiative? Sure. So, so this one is, is, is critically important. So enlarging the constituency for peace at a time which is even more critical than it was uh, uh, last spring uh, is, is important. So we are working with both Yossi and Munib to make sure that we add quality people uh, but uh, we, we grow the community. Also mainstreaming, so we are, uh, we are working uh, in Israel and Palestine, we are working with uh, a lot of people to make sure that, that you, you may know there is a communication vacuum right now around the negotiations. This is something that was uh, self-imposed by the negotiators to, to give them comfort uh, and, and calm to negotiate. And that is, of course, being used by, by a lot of people that are skeptical, so there is, there is some, some there is, there is no communication from the official side, but there are a lot of people that are saying, okay, we've seen this before, this is going to fail. And so also this group is working in Israel and Palestine to make sure that we put out uh, some of the thoughts that you've heard uh, into, the, into the mainstream media, uh, not only there, but also uh, in the United States uh, increasingly. So the public messaging thing is, is very important. Of course, it's also leading up to what the World Economic Forum does, which is, which is the Davos meeting at the end of January, so it's, it's, um, uh, it's uh, connected. Uh, I think the most important thing is building trust. So we are, and I think it should be said here that, uh, that uh, you know, we have new members coming in and the new members need to build trust with the ones that, uh, that, that have been there for some time. Uh, and, and if we can be, and if this community can be a bridge also to bridge that trust gap that may exist there uh, or, or build trust among the political leaders in what we call private diplomacy, this is, this is extremely important. So you touched upon it, uh, uh, Dan, in your, in your question before, but that's something that is, that is also ongoing uh, on the ground, but also here to make sure that uh, if there are any misunderstandings that uh, this group, I think it's one of the best groups because it's people that are trusted by the political leaders and if there are any tough messages that need to be delivered or any tough clarity that needs to be shed on certain things, uh, it's best done uh, by people that, that, uh, that you trust. And so this is something that uh, this group is working on right now. Okay. Why don't we uh, uh, take up Munib on his challenge to you to ask tough questions. Uh, we have about 15 minutes. Um, if you're on this side of the room, it's going to be challenging for me because I can't see you, but I'll try to find you, okay? Let's do number one and then number two. Please. Do we have microphones coming around? Yes, okay. If, if the, the, the person who asks can introduce himself. Yes. Uh, over at this table there. Please introduce yourself before asking your question. Hi, my name is Ann Rutherford, and I've been to many different seminars on the, on the uh, subject. I heard one person tell me that 95% of Israelis are not aware of the Arab peace negotiation or the um, peace initiative, and they had no reason to want to know it because they were all happy now that they're not, they don't have bombs going off in their homeland. So, are you going to do any more advertising or um, really getting to the citizens to for uh, for your peace initiative? Yossi, maybe you can take that. How do you tell the Israeli people that um, this is happening and that there is an Arab partner, okay. both First here and then generally? To, to qualify the number, the recent polls showed that uh, between 70 and 80 percent of the people of Israel want right now a two-state solution. I say that 95 percent of people don't want wars and and, uh, and uh, these sort of things. How we are going to explain to, to the people about uh, this, uh, this initiative? Our role to explain will come when the parameters of, the, of an agreement will be, will be announced. Right now we work more on a quiet uh, advocacy. We didn't go yet to the, pub, to the public, but we may do it in a, later, uh, in a later stage, depends on how the negotiations are rolling out. Okay. Over here. Excuse me. Microphone. Excuse me. Excuse me, sir. Here it comes. Okay. Hold up. Hold up, Brendan. 
I have a comment for Yossi and Munib and you'll see. Keep, keep the comments okay, very, sure. yes. very brief. I admire your optimism since Oslo. Munib, you kept saying Washington, Washington. America is more than Washington. It's Nebraska, it's New Hampshire. So if you're going to stick to Washington, you will not go very far. My question to you, Yossi, and you and I talked about this earlier. Prime Minister Netanyahu said a few days ago that the Palestinians need a Ben-Gurion. And the Palestinian responded by saying the Israelis need a de Gaulle. Is it possible that Prime Minister Netanyahu could become the de Gaulle of Israel? Yeah, we, we discussed it in the, in the corridor, and I told you we saw that, uh, that Begin became the de Gaulle of the Egyptian, of the Egyptian uh, uh, agreement. Arik Sharon left Gaza. You may argue if it was. Uh, in, in the right way or not, or the Palestinian like it or not, but the fact he was willing to give it away. These people, our, these, these leaders, can rise to the situation. And I told you that personally you can buy it or not. Again, I'm not here doing propaganda for the government. I'm convinced that Netanyahu would like to do, to do peace. He's, he, he's acting like this, etc. So I don't see any reason. I don't want Netanyahu to be the goal. I want Netanyahu to be Netanyahu who bring peace to Israel, and I'm quite certain he can do it. Let's see the ambassador to the Arab League, please. Yeah, thank you, Ambassador. Thanks. You know, I have a problem really standing, and my brother Munib has a problem sitting, so I would <laughs> rather. <laughs> anyway. Um, as you know that uh, peace uh, initiative, uh, the peace negotiations are stalled now and the Palestinian delegation uh, I think resigned or withdrew and they are looking for a different or another delegation team to replace them. So it's really complicated now. Uh, perhaps now I came to the conclusion that this is not the right time that the Arab League, which I represented, I attended part of the negotiation here, and the Palestinians should have gone into this negotiation in this turmoil and chaos in our region with countries very important who can affect really peace or war in the region, like Egypt, like Iraq, like Syria, and Lebanon. Uh, also, Israel feels for the first time, and this is not, I am not uh, saying myself, this is was quoted by many Israeli leaders and ministers who were here and there, that Israel feels in more than 60 years more secure than any other time. So I think that's why this weekend the whole thing, the whole process of, no, of, uh, of peace. Uh, also, uh, Mr. Yussi Mr. Yussi said that the two leaders, I think he means Abbas and Netanyahu, can solve the problem. No, there is only one leader who can solve the problem, and he is the President of the United States, who was not directly involved in the negotiation, which is too bad. This peace initiative needs a President of the United States to intervene. Because the United States is the one committed to the security of Israel. It's the one who said that they will keep Israel at any time, at any cost, stronger than all the Arab countries combined. So why should we go to any other leader? Uh, do you want to continue also? The demands of Netanyahu. Okay. That's a question if we can. Okay, yeah. Uh, no, it's really also, but it touches on all the, the main issues. None of them has touched on the problems involved. Netanyahu has both demands which are really unacceptable to any Palestinian or an Arab or a peace-loving nation anywhere in the world. Like, for example, no return to the 1967 borders because they are indefensible. And he wants to maintain military presence on its borders with the Valley of Jordan. No return to the refugees of the Palestinian, of the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of the Palestinians expelled in 1948. And also that Jerusalem is the eternal capital of Israel. And I can go and go and go and say many let reasons. Me, me so how can we have peace, a two-state solution, w with what's going on okay. now? Okay, okay, thank you. I could, I could, I could, I could. I could. Uh, gentlemen, let's look at the thing. We have a very difficult time. We have a difficult task. And we are not, we, we, want, we want all of us to support what we want to do. Three cases, I will tell you what happened, and that's what keeps me optimistic. A telephone that 
a great lady called Rita Hauser arranged for me and Mr. Uh, Rabin in the 85, 86 before Oslo. And he was calling from New York, I was in London. He called me and I, and he, uh, we talked for a while and he said, I, I told him, I would like to arrange a meeting with you and Arafat, our late President Arafat. He said, no, he will never do it, he will never do this, his hands are bloody. I, I told him, look, Mr. Rabin, no matter what you say, even if you bring Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, Muhammad, nobody can be, make peace with the Palestinians, or the Palestinians will listen to except Arafat. Well, days goes this, and then Yusi and I, we met in Casablanca, where I saw the two coming to me after the shaking hands of the, it was impossible, but it was done. I mean, it depends on the occasion and the, the people. I think Rabin shook the hands of Arafat, Arafat shook the hands of, of Rabin on the Rose Garden, the Rose Garden in the White House. It's number one. Number two, we have President Sadat going. He came to Tel Aviv and he did something. I was, I was in Beirut and I, I really cried when I saw it. The, the whole thing, uh, the whole psychological barrier, the hatred and other things gone. And I was a free man to see that it could be done. Thirdly, we were uh, in talking to, uh, uh, I don't know how confidential it is, but I'm going to say it to tell you, we were sitting with uh, Mr. Shimon Peres in his residence, and one said, one of the BTI said, uh, it might take five years to do this. And uh, Shimon Peres said, no, I'll tell you a story. I get a call from Mr. Sharon, he said he's coming to see me. Uh, did he ask if uh, still, uh, uh, what's his wife's name? Leah. 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 Yes, whatever. He said, is she still a good cook? This Sharon's uh, asking Mr. Uh, uh, Rabi, I mean Mr. Perez. He told him yes. So he came, he sat with him, and he knew he has something in his want to say something to Shimon Perez. He told him, Shimon, I did it in Gaza in 15 or 20 minutes, and I will do it in the, front, in the West Bank. So it's not going to take 15 years or five years or something. So if there is a will, if there is determination, it will be done. I, I think uh, we were present, all of us, we were present when we heard this. So, I mean, let's, let's say, let's do it. It, it. Let's not look back. We have so much things to look back at, but I think it's time now, open a new page and say, with you, with you, with everybody, I think we could make it. And I'm sure that you see and I and the, and the WEF working so hard, but we need your support to continue this because we have no interest, no personal interest, no economic interest, no economic cooperation except after the independence of Palestine. We will do business together, we'll do things together, we will tango together again. So it's, a, it's, it's something that we need to do. There is a light in the tunnel, there is six months, there is the administration, there is Kerry, and there is us, all of us. We can do it. And make, make sure that it could be done. It's not the most difficult thing. It's difficult, but if there is a will, there is a way. And we have the will to do it, and we need your will to do it. Yes. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, I would like to, to add uh, another quote of uh, Shimon Peres. You know, he has great uh, quotes. He says, two things are done better in the dark. The second one <laughs> is peacemaking. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is what he always says. So I, I said in the beginning that the narratives are very far away. The way that the Palestinians see what the peace should provide and what the Israelis should provide are two different things. Now the art of negotiations is to find creative solution to these differences. And we saw it in the past. We saw that Olmert and Arafat almost, uh, uh, Olmert, uh, and uh, Olmert and Abu Mazen and Barak, uh, uh, they close a lot, lot of the gaps. So I think that what we have to do, we have to try and to 
provide them the assurance that the people want it. You know, they have to know that the people want it. If we raise our hand and we say the gap is too far, uh, then nothing will, uh, will come out. I, th this, this, is, this is why, why this meeting and why, why, first of all, the involvement of Kerry is so, so important. And the most important thing that these two guys will continue to talk because I can tell you one thing. If they don't talk, there will be no, no peace. And you have to be cautious. Of course, you have to be cautious. Even Kurtzer, you know, in spite of the fact that Munib are, and me are good friends, he took very careful thinking to put Mirek between us. So, <laughs> I, we, I think we have time for one more question. And uh, unfortunately, because I'm sure we could stay for a while. We have Please. two. Let's, let's, have the, we have right, let's, take, let's take these two questions. And yes. hopefully, they'll be short questions. Very short. OK. Uh, Ian Shapiro from Yale University. Uh, n nobody has mentioned Hamas, and I would be interested in how people, uh, both speakers, see them fitting into the equation. Okay, Hamas, and the other question back here. Sir? Um, H.P. Goldfield from uh, Albright Stonebridge Group, Hogan Levels, and the board of the Middle East Institute. Um, against the, the backdrop of BTI and the business leaders you've assembled, against the backdrop of Senator Kerry's you know, economic development plan of $4 billion. How important is immediate job creation to creating the environment for a sustainable peace? Or does it have to await peace for it to occur? OK, Hamas and job creation. Media? Media job creation. Immediate. Job creation. What, what, what do you mean? She has you have a question? Is your word immediate? Yes. Or immediate job creation and Hamas or and or Hamas. Or I can say, gee, it's too bad. <laughs> Let's do job creation first. Me? Yes. Yossi. Okay, first of all, uh, as far as the BTI is concerned, whatever we touch upon economic issues, if at all, it is the Israeli side, it's after a peace agreement because the Palestinians made it very clear to us that uh, right now they are not interested to do anything which may be perceived as normalization. But I would like to provide you a personal testimony if I can. I am very much involved in the world in the IT industry. And I met quite a big number of young Palestinian uh, guys in the IT industry. And I can tell you they are as capable as anybody else and a little bit more motivated. And all of us remember the, the work that the Palestinians have done in the Gulf in the 70s. So this is, uh, in, uh, these, are, these are hardworking, a community, sophisticated, given the right condition, given, uh, I think there are now how many universities you have in, uh, in the Palestinian area, Monib? Seven? Anthony, how many universities? Seven. Seven, seven. seven universities. So I think, I think that, uh, that uh, the potential is there. Again, this is not the role of the Israelis. And between the Palestinians and the, and the international community, I'm sure this can be, can be done and should be done. And for sure, if there will be less conflict, everybody will be, will be benefit. We know it also from the experience, not on IT, but from the experience where uh, Palestinians worked in Israel. They were very thought after uh, workers. They are, uh, they are, uh, I can go into personal, personal story. I don't want to. They, they people with talent, they are hard workers, they are motivated. So why, why not? Also, I must tell you that uh, I toured two, two days ago. I was in, in uh, Palestine. I was in uh, Rawabi and in Ramallah. And you see the, not only the rate of construction and the number of the cranes, but the quality of construction and the beauty, the beauty of the building, it's quite, uh, it's quite amazing. Maybe, Munib, you shouldn't do peace 
so fast. Maybe it will walk away after the piece. Maybe it. Uh, <laughs> this was a bad joke, but uh, <laughs> sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. I see one of my granddaughters, she's lifting her hand, she wants to talk. She didn't know that she's lifting her hand, but now she's... <laughs> <laughs> no, she, no, she was hesitating. I was, yeah, sorry, I wanted to ask a question before... What's your the, name? What's your name? My name's Zaha, um, and I just want to thank you because you're coming and speaking here. This is a great initiative, especially because it gives future generate. It's great to see you guys talking about how you have hope for this initiative to work, especially because you are an example for the younger generations to feel like you can, to feel after you've had all of your ex experiences in this conflict, you show the younger generations that after everything you've been to, you're still trusting, you still have hope, and that gives us hope. And that gives us a reason to step in and redesign systems and want to collaborate together. And it's true because recently we've had more interactions with Israelis, we've had more interactions with Palestinians, and they want to see things happen and you are in a place where you can make things happen. And so I wanted to thank you. But the question I wanted to ask was, what type of future do you see if this initiative works and if Kerry and Obama make it happen, if Israel and Palestine make it happen. What do you want to see in the future generations of Israel and Palestine? How do you want to see them collaborate and do you think they will rise as a power together and form another image for the world that people will look up to and want to imitate? Very quickly. Very quickly, Yossi. Okay. I, I, honest, Honest to God, honest to God, I'm not saying it just to satisfy you. Honest to God, I was with 22 of my friends on, Thursday, on Wednesday. We toured Ramallah and Rawab, Rawabi, and I'm sure, and my friends are sure, if we have peace and these two communities can collaborate, you know, each one minding his own business, you know, each one running his own state, but the possibility is to work together are so immense and the people are so motivated and talented that I am sure that the, the, this will act as, a, as, a, as an example to other, other communities in the region. I am, given that there will be a peace, I'm extremely optimistic and I want to thank you very much for what you said. I just would like you to warn you one thing, you can learn from Munib and me many things, but don't be as stubborn as the two of us. <laughs> uh, I'll say from our side, I want to say something that last time I saw um, our president, Abu Mazin, he told me when he make sure to tell everybody that I'm very much committed, I want to do it, and he has his parameter, he has his things to do it. And he said, Arafat had set the, the stage and I'm going to continue the way that he's doing. I just want to assure you that he's doing everything he can to come to a conclusion, he want to come to a happy ending. He want to really, really make Mr. Netanyahu the, the, to, to give him the courage of Rabin to say, let's, let's do it. Let's tango. Before, uh, Wendy, before Wendy thanks uh, the panel, uh, I want to, in my professorial hat, give you homework. Uh, because it is critical in this Washington setting for our administration to know what's happened here today. For John Kerry to understand that what he participated in nine months ago was not a one-time endeavor, but these two gentlemen and their cohort are working day to day to try to make this happen. So please spread the word of what you heard today. If you're representing a foreign government or even the Arab League, please tell your host governments that this is an important and critical initiative which deserves all of our support. Thank you so much. I just want to say one word. I have I have a conversation with the Arab League uh, 
بوس دكتور نبيل العرب العربي and I'm glad his representative is here. He said, we still have the Arab Peace Initiative on the table. Please, Israel, look at it again. Let's, let's see where can we, the Arab world and the Islamic world, could cooperate. This is my personal thing. And I hope, I hope Israel will take it very seriously again. That's a message from the Arab League to say this, this message or this initiative it is something. It is something that it cannot be. It cannot be ignored. I hope. I hope, from the bottom of my heart, that the Israelis, because it answers many, many, many questions. I hope the Israelis will look at it very seriously and see how to engage with the Arab and Islamic world. I want to thank, thank you, you all very, very much for an inspiring and optimistic uh, panel. Let's hope that next year we will not have to have this kind of a discussion because it will be done. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>